If we could sit in the middle section, that'd be really helpful with uh, just the dynamics. I am going to use the whiteboard just uh, a little bit, but we're going to talk a little bit about how emotional health builds teams. My name is Al Soto, and I am really excited about this workshop because I've had the opportunity to live this workshop out. By the way, I've given you an outline. Um, the outline has more material than I'm going to go through. I've given you some extra resources that I will um, refer to, um, but those are resources that you can take with you and process and, uh, you know, use it to think through some things. Here's what I'd like to begin our workshop uh, with. I'd like you to take a quick moment and like you write out what is the most impacting memory that you have from your family of origin, both positive and negative, but one? What's the most impacting memory you've had from your family of origin growing up? I'm just going to give you a few minutes. No question. Just, just, just a question. Write out the most impacting memory. A what? Most impacting memory you had from your childhood, from your family of origin. Does everyone have a memory? Pretty much? Some people are going, no, I'm blank. I need more coffee. I get that one. What was the most impacting memory? Give you a, another minute here. I think learning leadership from my grandfather and really what the value of so what was that lear learning? What was the most impacting? Um, just learning the value of leadership from my grandfather and, you know, what it really meant to work for what it is you have. And I think we all have lots of work to do on ourselves, and it's definitely impacted me. That's awesome. Anyone else have a memory? All right here, we got it. My biggest memory from my childhood was that my older sister hated me. Wow. Yep. Wow, that, and that was really impacting. Yeah. So we, <laughs> some, some, some memories, matter of fact, most memories when I do this are negative memories that people share. They're not positive. Anyone else have another memory from childhood? I have one. Um, when I was a young kid, uh, my parents were divorced, but my mom's sisters came over and all my cousins came over and we had an 800 square foot house for 15 people. And that was both positive and negative because I got to be with my family, but then at the same time, it was learning boundaries and learning how to love each other even when you hated them. <laughs> so oh. driving each other nuts, but knowing that no matter what, we all came together and we were all there for each other to love on each other no matter what. Awesome. Two, two memories that I have that are the most outstanding memories in my life. Actually three, but I won't, I won't share all three. My first one is my earliest memory that impacted me was I was uh, about eight years old and my brother was seven. And uh, we lived in a duplex in Mountain View, and my parents were really excited because they had planned that my grandfather on my mother's side, who was a Pearl Harbor survivor, uh, uh, was going to play Santa Claus. And we're sitting in the living room, and he gets up on the roof, and he's stomping around, and we hear a ho, ho, ho. Now, we don't know it's him. And my parents go, it's Santa Claus. You need to get to bed really quick because he's going to bring your presence. And then all of a sudden, he had been drinking. So he was drunk up on the roof. And I, we hear a ho, 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 and then a loud expletive. 
And I remember my brother looking at me and saying, Santa wouldn't use that word. And he fell and hit the side of the fence. And when he came in with the presents, he was disheveled. And his beard was all up and he was banged up. And then he went out front and passed out. Pretty sad memory. My second uh, memory was my wedding day. When my wife, I will never forget the moment that when my wife stood there and I saw her there in her dress, I knew that life would never be the same. And I knew how much I had married way over my pay grade. And I made a vow that I would always see her in that moment as my bride. And so I refer to my wife to this day as my bride. Two shaping uh, moments. Here's what I've learned. Leadership is not done in a vacuum. Leadership is not just an intellectual process. It is an emotional process. And if we don't deal with things well emotionally, how we build teams and how we do teams are, 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 are either going to be very positive or very negative. And so what I, what I do is I call it unpacking your suitcase. It's kind of funny because, I, and I referred to it last night, people come to church, people that are on your ministry teams, people that you recruit are dragging a suitcase with them. And in their suitcase is all their life experiences. And if we don't journey with them to look into their suitcase and help them unpack what Jesus wants to unpack and then import what Jesus wants to import, what's going to happen is we're going to have a, a lot of ugly things take place. Let me tell you, one of the biggest things that will happen is we don't do conflict well. You see... Let me, let me kind of break things down. I'm going to talk a little bit about power here. When I use the term power, how many of you think of power when you hear the word in a negative term or a positive term? How many of you see power negatively? Okay. How many of us see it positively? Okay, some of us see it positively. Power is neutral. It is neutral. Matter of fact, every human being has power. Here's the thing, how we steward power is going to be predicated on our emotional health. People who steward power close to the chest, who are very hierarchical, who may use power in a way that they don't share power, that's going to have a different outcome from people who share power. So real quickly, because we're going to do more of, uh, of hearing what you have to say, we're going to talk a little bit about this word again, amago Dei. What does that mean? It's the Latin word which means we're created in the image of God. People are valued and they're not a commodity, but they're literally the power to change. And we are in the greatest shift in our country when it comes to leadership and how people use power. Let me give you an example of this. Um, there's an Eastern approach because how many of you know the Bible is an Eastern book? It's an Oriental book. It's not a Western textbook. You know, because of that, you have a very much integrated model in the scriptures between emotional and spiritual health. It's not Greek, uh, what we call plat uh, platonic way of looking uh, as the Western world has viewed it. You know, in our Western world, we have a very platonic view. That which is spiritual is very separate from that which is material. And that's how we've done life in America. But the Eastern view isn't that way. And matter of fact, the Eastern view doesn't even believe that, it's, that giving people knowledge is what equips them. They have a very transformational view of leadership in the scriptures. Matter of fact, it's, very, it's relational base, but it's transactional base. It's how we share our lives with one another. That's the reason why I think discipleship, we struggle with discipleship in America, because one of the things we want to do with discipleship is we want to make it curriculum driven. In other words, we're going to get a curriculum. I'm going to take you through a Bible study, and that's discipleship. That isn't discipleship. Discipleship in its purest sense is I'm sharing my life where Jesus is calling me to obey him, and I'm sharing that with somebody else, and they're sharing it back with me. Discipleship is a two-way street.
It's, it's people sharing their lives. When you read the book of Mark and you see chapter 3, there's a kind of this, this moment where Mark goes, and he's talking about the disciples being with Jesus. He says, and Jesus called the disciples to Himself. And they spent time with Him. And then they went out ministering the gospel of the kingdom of God, casting out demons and healing the sick. And you're sitting there going, Mark, what did they do? Well, I don't think Jesus had a homiletics class or a hermeneutics class. I don't think he sat there and taught expository preaching. What I think that Jesus did, though, is he shared his life. He spent time with them. And what we have to be committed to do in our leadership cultures is we have to stop uh, getting caught up on getting someplace fast and begin to embrace an Eastern thought of process. Process leadership says that we are always going to be in a state of process. We're never going to arrive. And every event that I'm spending time with people is significant as I share my life. Whereas the Western view is very, very platonic and it's information based. I'm just going to give you information. You memorize or just simulate what I'm telling you. And then you're going to be a really, really good leader. And that doesn't work. It just, it just doesn't work. Now, I guess he's following me with the side. He is. That's awesome i got to give it up to the staff here because I'm not easy to follow at times. So I want to talk about a systems approach to leadership. The last 12 years, I pastored in San Jose. We planted a church, uh, and, and I was there for 20 years. And then God said, I have a journey for you. After we planted our fourth church out of, this, uh, out of our church in San Jose, God says, resign. My 20th year, I resign. And for 12 years, I've been helping churches transition that have been struggling. So it's given me a very unique perspective to go into churches that are struggling and then in, and help them through the journey of what does it mean to, to, to get health again. And I want to kind of bring it up, th this thing with you, in terms of the dynamic. Uh, Brent, in his earlier um, session, was talking about culture. And I want to talk a little bit about the dynamics of what you have on your teams and why this is so important. Let's say, what's your name? Mallory. Mallory. I like me. That's a nice name. Mallory. You're a children's pastor? Uh, I'm an assistant, kind of. Okay. Well, you are a children's pastor right now. We got Mallory. And Mallory has been asked by the, 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 the pastoral team of her church to build a team that is going to do community compassion projects. So we've got Mallory. They get up on a Sunday morning and they do an interest meeting and saying, hey, we're going to start this team and Mallory's going to lead it. And it's going to do great things, integrating compassion ministry in our church and, and people are excited. So what happens is Mallory shows up and she has like six people there. And she's pretty excited. She goes, all right, that's awesome. And Mallory finds out a little bit of the backgrounds of these people. Well, I'll just put one here. She finds out that the first one is a millennial. And this, 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 this young, let's say he's a, he's a fella. He's a man. And this millennial, he, uh, he's, he's in college, he's been coming to the church, grew up in a single parent family, doesn't know his father, and is a little bit, got a cynical edge. Not that millennials would ever have a cynical edge, right? I love millennials. I'm serving with millennials now. I'm having the time of my life. Very creative, though. Very, very creative. And we're going to call him Bob. So Bob is really, really a creative millennial. And then we got Sam. Sam's a retired guy, and he's a boomer. My God, he bleeds Republican. <laughs> he, be, he bleeds Republican. He has been in middle management. He worked all of his life. He's got a good pension. He's a tither in the church. Sam's just as solid as they come. And when Sam hears the, 
the, the, the call that, of this new team, he, says to, he looks over to his wife and says, Honey, I'm going to explore this. I'm going to give it a shot. So we got Sam. He's the, the boomer, the retired boomer. Now we got Lori. Lori is a Gen Xer. She's married. Her oldest is in college. She's had a struggling marriage. Her and her husband have struggled financially. Matter of fact, they went through the economic uh, setback of 2008 and they lost their 401ks like a lot of people did. They're really struggling. There's tension in their home. They love Jesus. They've been going to the church. But quite frankly, they're really, really not grounded in their faith because they've never really come to church consistently. But they hear, she, you know, Lori hears this, 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 this cry for this team. So Lori says, man, I'm going to be a part of that team and I'm going to check it out. So here's the Gen Xer, Lori. Okay? Then we got Susie. Susie is a buster. She's in her mid-70s. She's been going to the church. But Susie's not your regular buster. She's got a lot of energy. Her husband, well, he just can't do as much as that he used to do. But she hears this thing, and she goes, man, I want to do something in the community, and I want to be part of this team. And she's a former school teacher. And, and anyone who knows Susie knows that she's sweet, but boy, is she direct. And she'll tell you how to do it better. Because she's a buster. And that's what busters do. Do you guys kind of see how the picture is kind of developing here? Boy, are you all praying for Mallory? I would be. Now, we got Tom. Tom is African American. He's, he's another millennial. But he's a little bit different than, than Bob over here. Because being African American, he didn't grow up in the suburbs. He came from an urban context. And so he's had some, he, he's seen a little bit different, a lot of diversity. He thinks differently. He's a Democrat even. He's a Democrat politically. And here he is, he hears the cry and he says, I want to be part of Mallory's team. Okay? You tracking? Now, we got a young person, real young person. And we're going to call, well, let's call her Tammy. And Tammy is a generation Y. She's a teenager. She's, she's growing up in a home that uh, economically her parents are struggling a little bit. They, they, they're living in right now in an apartment they're hoping to buy. But, but it's just been a little bit tough. She has about two other siblings, so there's three of them. They've been coming to the church for a few years. And she hears it and she says, you know what, I want to get involved on this team. Now, we got the whole spectrum of people. So give me some observations. What do you think some of the challenges Mallory's going to face leading this team? Go ahead. Tom and Sam might not always get along. Ooh, why? Why? Tell me why. Their personal views are very different, and because of that, their conversations um, could stray into arguments. Possibility there. Yeah. Tom and Sam. Woo! There could be some heat on that one. The elephant and the donkey. How many of you know every day of the week we got a miracle that happens in Washington, D.C.? Donkeys cross the aisle and talk to elephants. Amazing thing. We got two of them right on this team. Come on, you guys can't be that tired. That was good. <laughs> but what else do you observe here? As you pointed out, generation differences. So they each view money. They each view how the outreach should go differently. They each view who's deserving not differently. They, I mean, they're going to each view how they're going to do this ministry differently and perhaps have a different opinion. So Mallory has to somehow unite them. Yeah. 
Yeah, I personally think Mallory is going to start taking drugs. I think that's what's going to happen. <laughs> no, she's not. I'm joking. She's going to leave and go, blah, 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 blow bubbles and finger paint someplace, right? Generational. There's generational separation. What else? What else? Give me an observation. Several eight types. What's that? Several A-type personalities. Oh, yeah. Yeah, how are they going to bend with one? Because all of them, wouldn't you agree with me, generationally, every one of these generations steward power differently. The boomer is hierarchical. So he's always going to say, hey, listen, we've got to be top-down with this thing. The buster, we don't share power. We just tell you how to do it. The millennial, boy, they just kind of come and go, listen, we don't need systems. We don't, who's got a great idea? Let's just, let's kind of just, we're, we're going to be one big brainstorming. Right? And the Xers, ooh, Xers are interesting. Because X, Xers go passive aggressive. Their tendency is they're the hidden generation. And how they dealt with conflict is, you know what? We're going to be nice to your face, but boy, inside. If you can only know what I'm tweeting in my brain right now about you. <laughs> right? And she's all, she, she's called to lead all of these individuals. Now, we had a hand up here. She got it? She got it? So, let me ask you a question. How many of you have walked into this scenario or in this scenario right now? Yeah. <laughs> And can I tell you this? If you're not, you will be. Because in any growing context, diversity is what increases. Now, I'm going to tell you something through this process, and we're going to cover just a few things, and then we'll have some questions, and we'll talk about it. Mallory comes in, and she comes in with a strategy right off the bat. What happens the moment she begins with a strategy? <laughs> I'll say that again. I can, that was awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Well, what, what happens? Poof. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Why? Why? Tell me why. She came in with her generational stuff, with her ideas on how things should go, and then you've got folks coming at you from multi directions, and what she may have planned how she wanted to go isn't going to work, so she's going to have to adapt. Eggs. Oh, she has to do what? Adapt. Adapt. <laughs> Oh, if you could write this down in your notes, this, this is a key thing. Culture will always trump strategy. The challenge is we always want to begin with strategy and we don't even think about culture. So we get frustrated and we get, and how many of you walked away from a team meeting with these same kind of folks at the table and you go, this is frustrating. I don't even think these people are saved and know Jesus. <laughs> they don't. Because, because we want uniformity. But here's the truth of the matter. To do teams well, you can't just communicate head to head. You have to begin to communicate heart to heart. Amen. And where every person has a story and that's the beautiful thing of the gospel. People don't simply come to Jesus with their heads. They come with their hearts. And good team leaders know that emotional health for a team begins when everybody begins to unpack their story, which creates trust. Here's the challenge in the church. We default too many times that authority is by position and title when authority is credibility earned over time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm five months into a new church. You know, what I, you know what I tell people? People, because they're grieving the loss of two pastors that they had, then I'm, I'm, I'm in there now, and, they kinda, and I have had people go, Pastor Al, I don't know if I can... I like you, but, but I feel like I'm, if I like you, I'm basically... Basically saying to my former pastors that I'm being disloyal to them. You know why? They probably came from a meshed family systems in which loyalty was the highest thing that was given props and that's how they live their life. So they perceive 
Their loyalty and relationship with someone as being a violation to someone else. The biggest mistakes that we make in team developing, there's two words. Uh, this is the only time I'm going to use these, these fancy words. Adaptive and technical. We oftentimes make technical fixes to adaptive issues in the church. Let me explain to you what technical means. If we had a light bulb that was flashing on and off, and it, 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 it was a bad light bulb, and we just got one of those big lifts and changed the light bulb, that's a technical fix. But let's say, for instance, we were changing the light bulb, but the issue has nothing to do with the light bulb. It's a bad ballast that's shorting out behind the light bulb. Now, that's an adaptive issue, because even though the light bulb is going bad, it's dealing something with the system. And here's the thing that we forget. When we are making changes on any team, we are introducing people to grief and loss. And if we don't navigate grief and loss well, we won't be able to change and bring transformation well. So let me give you a good example. We just launched, I've been five months where I'm at, we needed to go two services. I took the last five months prepping our church to go to services. Several of my leaders came up to me and go, ah, why are we taking so much time? Let's just pull the trigger. Does anyone know why I, 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 I didn't pull the trigger going to services? Well, what's the issue with that? When you're going from one service to two, what's the big issue? It's change. It's change. And what's the, and, and people don't like to change. Why? I come here and now I'm not going to know everybody. And so they got that hurt and they go, Pastor, and you, even though you explain the whole strategy of everything you're doing, there's grief and there's loss. And so I would tell my, my leaders, listen, if I put a tech, I can't treat this as a technical fix. It is an adaptive issue. Adaptive issues are things related to the culture of whatever you're, leaving, you're leading. We can't make technical fixes to adaptive issues. We have to be able to process things well as it comes to teams. And diversity demands more process. It demands more process. And what does that process entail? It entails three things. It entails three things. Oh, my computer just went off on me. And here are the three things. First, relational trust has to be built. And relational trust can only happen in the context of us being able to have heart-to-heart -heart conversation. I get to hear your story, you get to hear my story. Here's the second uh, thing that we, we, we have to define what are going to be the guidelines and the ground rules of our behavior. If we don't do that, guess what happens? This is what's going to happen. Mallory is, is trying to lead the team through a, a process of a homeless feeding with the team. All of a sudden, we have Bob and we have Tom who are the who, who who basically are not seeing things the same way and they start having a heated discussion and they're they're debating this issue and then all of a sudden Mallory may say this oh you know what let's just table that we don't need to deal with that right now you know what happens we will do conflict the same way that our families dealt with conflict and here's the challenge, again, that we face in, in the church when it comes to emotional health, most of us perceive conflict as being bad. We'll avoid conflict. We'll do everything to go around it. And I'm here to tell you, conflict is not our enemy. Matter of fact, conflict, if done healthy, is the greatest catalyst to allow Christ to shape your new future. So you have to develop ground rules in terms of how do we debate and how do we argue points. Here's the third thing, and it's really important. 
we have to come with a very clear expectation of how do we steward power? How do we steward power? In other words, am I going to share power? Or am I going to hold power close to my chest? Am I going to do what leaders do when we're going to debate? And we'll have discussions and the team will make a decision on something. And then I just do what I'm going to do. And I go back to the team and say, those were great. Hey, but I noticed those, those were none of the, the ideas that we had. Yeah, I know. I decided I was going to do this. What does that do to team morale? Just kills it. You just told the team that, that they're a group, not a team. Real teams all carry the weight of responsibility for the mission that's trying to be done. That's the reason why you can't get there fast. Because in order to get to that place, you have to have trust. You have to have ground rules. You have to have all those things in place to be able to do what you need to do well. Now I'm going to skip down a little bit. And I'm going to just kind of highlight this slide. Five elements of chronic anxiety, if you're tracking me there on the slide. A guy by the name of Edwin Friedman says there are some real bad behaviors that come to chronic anxiety that are on teams. Do you know we all have anxiety? There's not, there's not one person that doesn't have anxiety. But Edwin Friedman says this. He says, depending on whether or not you deal with your anxiety and you know how to be separate and connected to the people that you leave at the same times so that you can make the best decisions for the team or with the team is whether or not your team's going to remain healthy. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have been in a situation where you know you should have dealt something, but you wanted to be liked? Huh? And that's what Jesus said, right? Jesus said, come into the ministry because everyone's going to like you and agree with you. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah, wrong. Wrong. How many of you avoided a decision or a personality on the team controlled you because you feared them? Yeah. Edwin Friedman calls that fear chronic anxiety. And here's what chronic anxiety tends to do. It makes people reactive in which they overreact emotionally to situations. Or they become herders. Do you know what a lot of churches will, will do when they're going through crisis? And we call it a good thing. We go, man, they stuck it out. They didn't, like in, where I'm at, they'll go like this. We didn't have a pastor, but our church stuck it out. Well, you know what they did? They herded. They circled the wagons. That's all they did. They circle the wagons. They, and what herding is, and you know where, where people herd the most? They usually will herd around the most unhealthiest voice. Yeah. The person who has the most unhealthiest voice is who, then they'll, or there's blame displacement, where they'll just shift blame. Or there's people that go, let's fix it quick. We can't have conflict. I want everyone to like each other. So they just want a quick fix. They want a technical fix to an adaptive issue. Or they're just lacking well-deferentiated leaders. In other words, they don't have leaders that can be, and you, here's how we're going to define uh, differentiated. You have to be a non-anxious presence in the midst of anxiety. How can I be a non-anxious presence in the midst of anxiety? So, how many of you had members of the team that no matter what's going on, they always approach you like the sky is falling? And then they can't figure out why they can't recruit to their areas of ministry. Do you know why? Because people perceive that as drama. And most people don't want to be around drama. So you as a leader, have to, and I've done this with people, where I've had to sit down and go, hey, you know what? Do you know when you come at people like that, the reason why they're not wanting to follow you is... Man, you're way over the top with your anxiety. But if we don't do this right now, Pastor Al, you don't understand. The church is going to, it's just not going to succeed. And it's like, really? Really? We have to get that kind of brand of coffee for the coffee cart, and the whole ministry of the church is going to fail as a result of that. <laughs> it, it exaggerates symptoms, but it doesn't deal with the issue. 
So I'm going to give you a very practical step. I'm going to skip these slides because I'm going to go down here. What's one of the first things that we do? I'm going to give you one, and I think a copy of this is in your notes. So here's what I'm going to ask. I think the very first thing you do with your team is you develop what is known as a covenant, a team covenant. At Bayside of Lincoln Church, we came up with a team covenant. We spent three months as a leadership team. And by the way, we're just starting the process now in the church I'm pastoring. And what a team covenant says is that we're going to develop a team covenant that says this is how we're going to do life as a team. Here's how we're going to lead together. So we picked a passage of scripture and we said this is going to be our passage. And then after some, some, some several months of discussion, here was our team covenant. We are committed to having a prayerful attitude and intentionally following through on our, our commitments to others. So how many of you, you know what? We got to the point where we never even dealt. I was in a, you know, pastors are, shouldn't be sheriffs. We're not firefighters. When leaders get into firefighting mode, they can't lead. We handle conflict in the team. So let me give you an example. Being respectful of one another. How many of you have been in a team meeting where the whole environment of the team is being controlled by a person who's rolling their eyes and it looks like they don't even want to be there? How many of you have been part of that team? And you just try to get through the meeting. What does it do to the dynamic of the team? Kills it. And what else happens? You can't get your best ideas. So you know what we do? We had that happen to us. We had a person that was part of our team and they were doing that. And I said, excuse me, we're going to stop right now. Hey, and I'll just say, Susie, why are you, I, we noticed that you're being really detached right now and you're rolling your eyes and what's happening. Do you know it had nothing to do with the team? Everyone in that meeting thought she was angry at the team. Come to find out she had just gotten a phone call from a family member on the East Coast about a negative report medically. And she was just absolutely beside herself. And when she began to share it, she just began to weep. And then we were able to pray with her. And then when we moved on in the meeting, guess what happened? The whole thing lifted. If we learn to begin to engage in a healthy manner in front of the team, it reduces triangulation outside of the team meetings. And it builds greater trust with the team. So one of our first covenant points was we're committed to having a prayerful attitude. We are committed to unselfishly treat others with mercy, grace, kindness, humility, and gentleness. We are committed to maintaining a healthy team atmosphere, putting the team needs first, remaining teachable and open to counseling. We are committed to living in peace, speaking in truth and love, and actively seek to resolve conflicts. This was our team covenant. So on our teams, how many of you have been part of a team where it gets really discouraging when one of the teams is underperforming and you have to overperform or other members of the team are overperforming to make up what that person isn't doing? Huh? That's, that's discouraging. And you know what we do? We think it's really spiritual when we overperform. We even have, we come back and we go, we talk to our other people and we go, well, you know, Bob's not doing his job. But boy, we've had to. We've worked so hard. Oh, Jesus must be pleased with us. And we get into martyr mode. But then we talk about Bob. Which is wrong because the greatest form of discipleship is how we handle conflict on a team. Did you hear what I just said? The greatest form of discipleship is how we handle conflict on a team. So on our teams that I lead, people will look at Bob and say, Hey, Bob. Why, why aren't you carrying your weight? What's going on? Do you need help? What, what do you need? How can we serve you to help you get what you need to get done so that the team can move ahead? Rather than overperform. Do you know what happens when people overperform? Pastors do it all the time. Well, you know, I'm not going to ask anyone to do it because they don't want to anyways. So I'll just do it myself and I know it's done right, right? But that sounds so good, isn't it? Especially when you speak in tongues and you do it. It's just so spiritual. You know? But no, it's wrong. Write this down. Overperformance of leaders 
is the greatest behavior or the most impactful behavior that keeps teams and organizations stuck. Sometimes it's the overperforming people in the team because they're not dealing with something honestly that that what happens is is they 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 keep things stuck because they're not dealing with the roadblock that needs to change. So I'm going to leave you this thought then we'll ask questions. Develop a language that, that you can debate as members of the team. Let me give you an example. At the church that I'm pastoring now, we have introduced that if, if, if there's an idea that Mallory and I are debating on, I'll look at Mallory and I'll go, hey, Mallory, can I push back on that idea? And Mallory goes, sure. What did, what did I just do by saying, can I push back on that idea with Mallory? What? what? I respected her, and what else? I did not personalize my pushback to Mallory. I kept it to the idea. We depersonalize our debate. Let me tell you another thing that we do. We call it putting the pig on the table. It's a pig where I come from. It might be a moose where you come from. <laughs> or a Prius, I don't know. But anyways, because you can lift a Prius up. You know, any car that you can stick your hand out and turn on the freeway with your arm, that's, that's a Prius. Anyways. Putting the pig on the table means I'm letting everyone on the team know that this is kind of the elephant in the room that I think we're all not wanting to deal with and I'm placing it on the table because I, need to, I think we need to discuss it. That's what it means. Um, or how about this one? We have another way. We go, we, we go, I'm getting off the dance floor. That's another language we do. You know what that means? Let's say Mallory is processing and she wants to get the big picture of something. So what she chooses to do is um, she'll tell everybody, I'm kind of off the dance floor right now. Can you give me some moment? And we really use this language. And everyone on the team knows that she hasn't detached. She's not angry with everybody, but she's processing and that she'll get back on the dance floor or into the meeting and the discussion. Now you may think, boy, come on, these are simple things. People, people don't know this. If you don't have ground rules to how you share power in the language that you use in your collaboration, people will interpret your behaviors from their cultural generational perspective. Does that make sense? So, so, so you want to be able, we also have another one, it's called heart check. If somebody on the team in the middle of a discussion says, uh, I, I'm having a heart check right now, it means that they're processing something very deeply that's impacting them and they need a few moments before they can articulate their idea. So we do heart check as well. Hey, right now I'm kind of doing a heart check with that. So I'm going to pause right there, questions, comments, thoughts. You all already do this on your teams. Hey, this is a lot of work, isn't it? But when you get to this, your team becomes a high-performing team. In Lincoln, we were able to pull off stuff because our teams got to the place that they were just rocking it. The level of trust. And you know what people get to do in a healthy team environment when you're doing this? They graduate. They disciple. They become leaders. They begin to mature. They begin to grow. But any thoughts, comments, questions, perspective? You mentioned a way of building trust is sharing stories with each other. Um, uh -huh. So stories are messy and yes. sometimes they're ugly. Um, how do you facilitate that in a way that, especially if you have someone on your team who's really uncomfortable with feelings or with messy and somebody who's really open about right. feelings and messy, how do you Good question. facilitate that in a way where you know, people don't walk away going, okay, I'm not coming back to that again? That is a great question. Let me tell you the ground rule for that. We always tell people we want appropriate disclosure that does not uncover anybody that's not in the room or anybody that is in the room. That's the first thing. So Bob can't come in and go, well, let me tell you about my wife, guys. My wife is not, your wife's not in the room, Bob. You can only talk about you. So we, we set some very 
healthy boundaries that says you can't uncover anybody that's in the room or outside of the room. Secondly, um, you as a leader will sometimes may have to intervene because sometimes people will go some places that you'll go, hey, you know what, Bob? Um, maybe let's, I, that's really important, but maybe we might not want to go in depth to the degree because some people will want to be so vulnerable that they'll go places and then shame kicks in because when they leave the meeting, they go, what did I just do? So you as a leader have to be really savvy um, to be able to kind of guide the discussion and lend some, some leadership to that. But heart-to-heart -heart discussion. Let me tell you, can I tell you the question that I always begin with every new team? Tell me about, I just gave it to you, what is one of your memories from childhood? You may not realize this, this one question unlocks the door to discussion that is absolutely huge. Because when people start talking about their family of origin stories, wow. Now we're a bigger group and this is a little bit more uncomfortable, but a few of you kind of risked it. But in a smaller context when you're building a team, it becomes a, an incredibly powerful tool of, of having a heart. And what it does is you begin to know that other person. Because as they speak, they will begin to talk about how they interpret culture. So let me give you a good example. If, and Mallory, I'm not, you're just up front, so you're, you're just awesome. So let's say Mallory goes like this. I came out of a family that um, my parents were divorced. And when I came to the church, the church is like a family to me. What did she just tell you? She, she just told you how she sees the culture of the church. Now, in our church, we don't use the word family in our church. And I'll tell you why we don't. It's a dangerous word. Because whose family is the church going to be? Mallory's family? My family of alcoholics? Boy, that would be really wonderful. So we call it the new community or a community of faith. And then somewhere down the line when we begin to use the family, we come up with a common understanding. By the way, you know Jesus never referred to the church as a family. In his day, family was an, uh, was an idol. It's a dangerous word. There are some words that we just will identify. But man, if Mallory says that this, this, this church has been like a family to me, she has very deep ties with the church meeting some very deep needs in her life. And boy, I, I, as a leader, I kind of tuck that away and go, wow, this is a big deal for Mallory. It's a big deal. So when conflict happens in the church and people that, that Mallory loves get hurt by it, what do you think happens to Mallory? It's devastating. It's devastating. Right? Anyone else? This is a lot of work. It's hard work. When you build your covenant, you take time and you walk through the process. Now, if you go back and you say, hey, we would like to build a covenant, I, I, I could Skype with you. We could talk with you. I'd be, uh, I'm, I'm open to doing whatever I can to help you and your teams start covenants. It will be the tool that helps you bring health to your team. And if you stay true to your covenants, it will help a low-performing team become a high-performing team. Sure. perfect world, it should begin with your board and it should trickle down. If you do not have the ability to influence that, you still do your own covenant on your team. I've done, I've, I've consulted several churches that we've done this. I'll give you some examples. One church in the Bay Area has done this. I, I've been working with them this last year. 
they've gone from um, an average attendance of about 30 to 40 uh, children in their children's ministry uh, to now they're uh, running well over 125 a Sunday within six months. Now, in that situation, they went from 0 to 65 in their team covenant. I mean, their first meeting went three and a half hours, and I bowed out, and they were still hammering out language and going to the mat with one another in terms of their principles, and they did a good job with it. So as much as possible, develop a covenant. Now, let's talk about from a system standpoint. If you are a children's pastor and you have like a Wednesday night team, a Sunday night team, the best way that you can influence the culture of your team is I encourage ministries to create a lead team. Here's what a lot of children's pastors do and they burn themselves out. A lot of children's pastors have a natural bent to being, um, well, number one, Children's pastors are either really good with the kids and not very good with the parents or really good with the parents and not very good with the kids. They usually have to have an area where they can try to do both well. And that's a skill. Wouldn't you agree with me? It's like I've been a high school football coaching. Love the kids, but sometimes some of the parents are way over the top. Right? So, so you have to develop. So what, what you want to do is develop a lead team. The tendency with children pastors is... Every week, you have the one ministry of the church that you've got to make sure it's fully staffed and ready to go, and then you go, I just don't have enough time for anything else. Yes, you do. Create some margins in your schedule and develop a lead team where you can get your influential stakeholders on a team that represent your ministry, and you begin to influence your ministry through that team. If you do that well, what that's going to do, it's going to create a base that's going to help you develop and, and, and bring health to the height of your organization as a children's ministry. But, it ta- but you got to, listen, team, write this down. This is, this is a, a thought that, that's simple, but it's so important. You have to restore, you have to become patient not to get to any destination fast. Yes. Exercise patience to do the hard work by really building your teams so that you can have healthy reproduction down the way. I'm not saying you stop all your ministries. What I'm saying is you're like a CIA stealth person. And you're coming in and you're getting your key stakeholders and you're going to begin to develop with this lead team a way that you can lead into the future by influencing more people and being more strategic in terms of how you do it. But it is a lot of work. It is a lot. And if you're a people person, it's even harder because your tendency is, I just want to spend time with the one. This big picture stuff frustrates me. But as a leader, you've got to deal with the big picture stuff well. You've got to deal with it. Because you won't do the relational stuff well if you don't get that done well. So, what time are we supposed to be out of here? What's that? 12.15. Can I just finish up with just one quick story? Okay, here it is, and then we're done. So here's the the quick story. I had a, a friend of mine who has a daughter that was up here in Bellevue, Washington. He pastored for years. I don't know how many of you remember a guy named Doug Maron. Doug Maron was a friend of mine. We were at a conference one day, and he told me about his daughter. His daughter had some type of a muscular disorder where she had to wear braces when she walked. And one day at school, she was part of this, this class team environment where they were going to tell everybody what they wanted to be in life. And on this day, Johnny said he wanted to be a fire chief. Another person said they wanted to be a police officer. When it got to her, she said she wanted to be a ballerina. And this one kid, and every class has to have one, looks at her and says, That's dumb! You can't be a ballerina. You can hardly walk. And she was devastated, so devastated that the teacher let her go home early. Well, my friend goes, you know, Al, I got the call from my wife at the office. I went home, and when I got there, my wife, I, I looked at my wife, and, and, and she said she's in the room. She's been crying all afternoon. He got in there. She was sprawled out on her bed. She was just weeping. 
Here's what happens. She, when she looks up, she says, oh, it's you, Dad. She goes, hey, honey. He, did, he said, Al, I didn't know what to say. He said, can we just take a few moments and pray and ask Jesus what he has to say? And they paused. And five minutes became ten, and he said he got nervous. He says, Jesus, you better say something quick. And all of a sudden, she looked at him with a big smile on his face and said, Dad, Jesus spoke to me. And he goes, honey, what did he say to you? She said, Jesus said, I'm already a ballerina. I use that story to say this. As leaders, the greatest influence we exercise is to help people discover and cultivate what Jesus has already placed in them. If we start there, everything else will work out. Thank you. It was great spending time with you this afternoon.